So very good afternoon to all. Once again, it is our great pleasure to welcome you all to the uh, second day of a lecture series on mechanical behavior of materials. So this lecture series has been initiated to enhance the knowledge of researchers, faculty members, and students community in the fundamentals. So, so, so yesterday's session was very excellent. And today, I hope you are ready to uh, take away the contents from today's lecture. And it is our great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. V.P. Sir for this particular lecture over once again. I welcome you, sir. And uh, I request V.P. Sir to please uh, go out of the session. Okay. Is it visible that I can do that? Please, sir. Please, you can go ahead, sir. Okay. I can remove this soft shell, right? Yeah, hide. You can, you hide, can hide, sir. Hide, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Nice, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, friends, once again. Uh, I think uh, you enjoyed the yesterday's lecture that is on uh, tensile behavior of materials. Maybe uh, some uh, four or five slides are left out in that uh, tensile behavior. If time permits, I will cover uh, those slides today. And uh, today we will see that uh, the another behavior uh, entirely different from the what we have seen yesterday. That's on the fatigue behavior of materials. Uh, so, what is uh, fatigue? How it is different from the tensile behavior? If you take uh, the most of the mechanical components. Um, Will fail under the fatigue loadings. Mechanical components, most of the service failures, you can uh, you can take uh, the uh, data of the service failures of the mechanical component. It is reported that 90% of service failures on mechanical components is mainly because of the fatigue failures. Uh, that's why the fatigue is a little bit trivial and it is a, a critical one also for the designers. So today we will see uh, the, I, I have divided this fatigue into two parts. The first part today we will see the fatigue behavior alone. And tomorrow we will uh, see about, discuss about the fatigue track work behavior. And uh, the, uh, as far as fatigue is concerned, how it is different from the tensile behavior. Uh, tensile behavior we have seen yesterday, the load, the load which we are applying is the unidirectional load. We are applying load in the any direction one direction that means for uh, pulling the material yeah pulling the material so by pulling the material you are uh, deforming it or you are straining it by strain the material can withstand to certain extent then beyond certain level it cannot withstand then failure slowly it will go to the failure mode but fatigue failure it is uh, the application of load uh, the is different it is how it is different here, the load direction is uh, two direction. It is in the pulling direction as well as in the pushing direction. So you have uh, the, the, the load is in the cyclic mode. So some part of the time, the load will be acting on the, that is a fluctuating load. We can say it is not tension and compression alone. We will we'll discuss in detail. Uh, it is not only tension and compression, even in the tension, will fluctuate between the maximum to minimum stress level. So if the load is fluctuating, that's why it is called a cyclic load. The load is, is not a, a static load. The tension is the tensile behavior. We are using the static load. Here it is the cyclic load. The load is a cyclic load. If the component is subjected to cyclic load, then the failure normally in the tensile behavior, how the failure occur? The failure will occur first the material will get deformed 
from elastic deformation it will convert it will move on to the plastic deformation even in the plastic deformation it will reach just a maximum point maximum load point from there the failure will happen so it is here it will show some indication so normally what the people do the designers will design as i told yesterday they will take yield strength as the the maximum strength they will take from there they will apply the factor of safety and then the design stress is calculated normally design stress is equal to yield stress divided by factor of safety so it is uh, you have to apply factor of safety the factor of safety n the factor n is it's, it's, it will vary from the component to component if it is the uh, critical component the factor of safety will be higher n will be higher if it is the ordinary component general use component general application component the factor of safety will be lower maybe 2 or 4 something like that but critical component the value will be very high so you have to apply this factor of safety and then from the yield yield strength yield stress divided by factor of safety what are the stress you are getting that is called the design stress design stress means what it is it permissible or allowable stress so that the, you, you need the, the the component which is designed for the stress the stress should not exceed that stress. why they are saying it's not exceed the stress because if it exceed the design stress then failure is inevitable but here so there in the, in the calculation of designers mostly they refer to the uh, yield strength or yield stress but in the fatigue loading in the cyclic loading the failure will occur even well below the yield strength itself so that is the yield stress itself even the stress is lower than the yield stress then the failure will occur so that type of that is the critical aspect of this fatigue behavior so that's why people are uh, studying this fatigue uh, fatigue behavior fatigue crack growth behavior all those things in depth but it is a little bit <coughs> complicated subject not like uh, our uh, pencil behavior there is a small complications are involved but if you uh, follow the uh, the lecture then you can understand easily what is fatigue is what are, what are, what are all of this uh, so yes what are the characteristics fatigue failures occur when metal is subjected to repetitive that's very important repetitive fluctuating stress so that is very important and we fail at a stress much lower than its tensile strength normally the our general assumption is it will not fail below the tensile strength about tensile strength only the necking will start the necking will start in the uh, material uh, that is in the maximum uh, load carrying point and from there the failure will occur but here the lower than its tensile strength and another thing is fatigue failures occur without any plastic deformation that's very very another uh, interesting characteristic feature of this uh, fatigue failure it will not show any plastic deformation right so you know what is plastic deformation is plastic deformation means a permanent deformation as i told yesterday it's a permanent deformation so definitely there will be a change in the dimensions change in the shape change in the profile change in the geometry so that will occur but in fatigue failures without any plastic deformation that means it will not give any warning before it fails that's a problem with fatigue that's why it is very very significant So there is it will not give any warning before it fails and another third one is the fatigue surface appears as smooth region showing beach mark or origin of fatigue crack we will i will come back to that what is beach mark and other thing when we discuss about fatigue crack book behavior you can understand if you look into this uh, uh, figures photos uh, crank shaft failure and fatigue failure of a board you see the surface the surface is sorry for interrupting sir yes Sir, you are in second slide, sir. Yeah. Sir, it's not moving, sir. Uh, still, we are in the introduction slide. No, no, introduction, introduction only. Okay, right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Now only I move. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. So this is uh, some components which failed under the fatigue loading, um, and even the automobile, lot of moving components wherever you have, so you will find the fatigue failure is very common feature in the automobile components. Right. So the coming back to the uh, fatigue failures. What are the factors that will affect the fatigue? 
fatigue failure. So basic factors are normally the fatigue failure will occur under the tensile stress. It will not occur under the compressive stress. So the tensile stress, that even the tensile stress, there should be a maximum value. It should not occur at a minimum value of tensile stress. Tensile stress means you have two stresses. No? One is the tensile stress, other one is compressive stress. Tensile stress is pulling stress, compressive stress is pushing stress. Okay, you are compressing it, you are pressing it. That is not compressive stress. Tensile stress is you are pulling it, you are pulling the material. When you pull, you, the, the, the stress which is acting on the component is tensile stress. So you need a tensile stress. Not only the tensile stress, that should have a maximum magnitude. The value of the tensile stress should be some value, higher, greater value. But not only that tensile stress, because if it is alone, only the first point, tensile stress alone, then it is called as the tensile behavior. But here, the difference is the second and third point. The tensile stress will fluctuate. There is a variation in tensile stresses. Variation in fluctuation in the applied stress. Variation means what it is varying from maximum to minimum. Maybe it will be varying from uh, 200 megapascal to 50 megapascal, or from plus 200 megapascal to minus 100 megapascal. So it, there will be a lot of variation in the load. And then not only one variation, one time variation, that variation should be a continuous one. A variation, a fluctuating load that should be acting on the component continuously. That's why a sufficiently large number of cycles that is required. So it will not fail in one cycle, it will not fail in two cycles, it will not fail in three cycles. We'll see what is cycle is. Cycle is nothing but variation in the stress, maximum to minimum. That's the cycle, one cycle. So that should be the number of cycles should be more, more in number. So you need a tensile stress, that is the plus pulling stress is required. That should be maximum and that the stress should be fluctuating one and the fluctuation also many number of times so these are the basic factors what are the other factors not only these three factors there are other factors you can say secondary factors that will also cause us the fatigue failure is stress concentration it's very very important stress concentration and uh, corrosion temperature overload structure even the metallurgical characteristics of material Residual stresses, combined stresses. So the, all these are the secondary factors. But main factor is maximum tensile stress, and variation in the tensile stress, and the variation should be large in number. Then only the fatigue failure will happen. So this is called the stress cycle. So what is the, I, I told you in the previous slide, I told the cycle, stress cycle. So if you look at this, because why I introduced the slide is, we should understand what are the notations used throughout this lecture. There are different notations in use. What is the notations in use here? So it is a, a typical stress cycle. The slide what you are seeing is it's a typical stress cycle. So if you see the y-axis, the y-axis is stress. So the stress is varying from plus and minus. Plus means it is a tensile stress. And minus means it's a compressive stress. But this stress cycle is fully on the tensile stress region alone. There is no compressive stress here. Okay, because the compressive stress is it is the compressive stress is not significant as the tensile stress as far as the fatigue is concerned. I will come back to the why why compressive stress is not significant. I will explain later. So here, if you see this curve, this is a stress cycle. It is a curve, a sinusoidal curve. Okay, it looks like a sinusoidal curve. So the, the, the medium stress is, the average stress is, initially it is zero. Above that it is a plus, tensile stress, and below that it is the compressive stress. So if there is a term called the maximum stress. Maximum stress here is denoted by sigma max. Sigma is used for the stress, and sigma max is the maximum stress. So from the zero to the maximum value of the stress. That is called the maximum stress. Minimum stress. So the stress is, as it all know, it is fluctuating, it's varying from maximum to minimum. It's not a um, constant load or static load. It is a varying load. It is the cyclic load. 
So it is varying from maximum to minimum. This cycle is going on, it's repeated many times. So the minimum stress is from zero. What is the minimum stress? That's the sigma minimum. Minimum stress is referred by sigma minimum. So stress range is nothing but the difference between maximum stress and minimum stress. Normally, it is denoted by delta sigma or sigma r, sigma suffix r. So, that is the stress range, delta sigma or stress range, sigma max minus sigma minimum. And then another uh, terminology is alternating stress, alternating stress. What does it mean by alternating stress? The difference, stress range divided by 2, average of or the, the, the difference between maximum stress and minimum stress by 2 is alternating stress sigma max minus sigma minimum by two. mean stress average stress mean stress is nothing but average stress sigma max plus sigma minimum by two it is denoted by sigma m alternating stress is denoted by sigma a there is another interesting term it's a terminology it is called stress ratio it is very 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 frequently used term stress ratio or r capital r capital r is the stress ratio why it is no? It's a normally no. We, we know that the maximum by minimum is ratio. No, here minimum stress divided by maximum stress is stress ratio. Or so you should remember many times. No, many people will um, mistakenly they will say it's a maximum stress divided by minimum stress is stress ratio. No, it is all. It is ultra of minimum minimum stress divided by maximum stress. That is called stress ratio. And similarly, the another uh, terminology is amplitude ratio. A, so it is denoted by capital A. It is given by um, alternating stress divided by mean stress. Alternating stress and divided by the mean stress. That will be given by the, the uh, denoted by the amplitude. So these notations, these terminologies will be used in the coming slides and throughout this lecture, not only today and tomorrow also. This will be used. Right. So, I told you whatever I showed earlier, it is here a typical stress cycle. But in the petty, we have three different stress cycles generally used, generally applied uh, for evaluating the petty behavior. One is the completely reversed stress cycle. It's in the sinusoidal form, what we have seen earlier. And then another stress cycle is a repeated stress cycle. Um, and random stress cycle. So these are the three types of stress cycles. You will see one by one. What is this? And uh, it's the first one, completely reversed uh, cycle of stress. Okay. So it is a sinusoidal in shape. Shape is sinusoidal, shape of the curve, and it is varying. If you see that, the you have tension component and compression component. Okay. Tension stress and compressive stress. So the stress is varying from zero. Initially, it is zero. And then it is increasing, the stress is increasing, reaching a maximum, maximum tensile stress. And then it is dropping it, and again it reaches zero. From zero, the direction of stress, direction of loading, loading direction is reversed to go to the compressive field or compressive stress field. So again it is in compression, it reaches the maximum. And then from maximum it goes coming back to zero. So from this zero starting to the, the tension one half of the uh, curve and another of these two if we combine together, one tension cycle and one compression cycle combinedly called as the one full cycle. If you take only tension cycle, it is half of the cycle. And if you take compression alone, it is half of the cycle. So tension plus compression cycle is combinedly called as one cycle. So this will be repeated for many number of times. So this means that what does it mean here? Completely reversed. Why the name is completely reversed? So the magnitude of tensile stress and compressive stress. You know what is magnitude? If I apply plus 200 megapascal and the same 200 megapascal will be applied in the compressive load also. Only thing is the direction is different. Plus 200 to minus 200. Plus 100 to minus 100. Plus 200 means, let's see, tensile stress, maximum tensile stress. And similarly, minus 200 means it's a maximum compressive stress. So the magnitude will be same. Magnitude of the stress is same. 
Okay, the magnitude is same, but the direction is different. So two different directions. Okay, tension and compression direction, but the magnitude is different. Please understand the magnitude means the value value of the stress. Okay, if I use if I fix 200 megapascal plus. Then in the completely reverse cycle, if you select the machine in the completely reverse cycle, the compressive stress also will be 200 megapascal, but in the opposite direction, minus. 50. So this is known as the completely reverse cycle. In the completely reverse cycle, what is R? Anyone says R is what stress ratio? We all know R equal to stress ratio. Capital R. It's not small R. Capital R. Capital R is stress ratio. What is stress ratio here? Minimum stress by maximum stress. Okay, so minimum stress. If I say it is the uh, the uh, compressive stress is the minus 200, and uh, the tensile stress is plus 200. What is R? R equal to minus one. Minus 200 divided by plus 200. Then it will be minus one. So in this cycle, in the complete reverse cycle, R equal to stress ratio equal to minus one always. Minus one always. Right. The second stress cycle is. The shape is same. Almost uh, it looks like a sinusoidal uh, shape, sinusoidal curve. But what difference? The difference is if you see that the stress is all the whether maximum stress and minimum stress both are in the tensile stress portion. Tensile stress field. It's not tensile stress portion. It is a tensile stress field. There is no compressive stress field in this case. In the repeated stress cycle. Only it is in the tensile stress cycle. So it, it is here varying from 0 to plus, plus 200. Maybe the minimum stress you can say it is a 50 megapascal, and maximum stress you can say it is a, a 200 megapascal. Okay, it is varying from 50 megapascal to 200 megapascal. 50 megapascal plus 50 megapascal to plus 200 megapascal. So it is a repeated stress cycle. So this is possible in the most of the, uh, the petty testing machines what we have instant type of i'll show the uh, photos tomorrow uh, those machines so it's capable of applying this type of repeated stress cycle but the previous one which we discussed completely your cycle it is normally people use there is a rotating beam petty testing machine rotary bending rotating bending i used to say it's a tabletop machine uh, the machines are there so there it is, this type of load, only this is a fixer. The stress ratio is fixed here. But here you can vary the stress ratio. R can be varied from any value from 0 to any value you can vary here and the stress ratio. And the third one is the random stress cycle. So this is very practical. Actually, the actual actual component will be subjected to is the actual components. Are subjected to this type of random cycle because we don't know because not those uh, what whatever we have seen these two these two are easy to simulate in the lab conditions laboratory conditions this completely reverse cycle, uh, stress cycle the machines are there as I told no rotating beam particular simulation for this servo hydraulic particular simulations are there for producing this uh, cycle but here this random stress cycle is very, very difficult because it is the actual actual stress cycle. Suppose if, if you take uh, aircraft, okay, aircraft, when you are flying in the aircraft, so the wind velocity, you know, wind is, the aircraft is moving against the wind, okay, so there is a lot of friction and it's uh, outside, outside the body, aircraft body, the wind is always, you know, you have some velocity. So that wind velocity will vary from one location to other location. Okay, it's not same. So that's why you know the seat belt is very very important. Immediately the pilot will announce where the seat belt because there's a turbulence. Okay, so the turbulence means what? The wind velocity is varying, and because of that, the load acting on the component the aircraft is varying from time to time. It will vary. It is not here. Constant load. It's one thing that is that there is no variance. It's a, it's a throughout its travel. If you are traveling from Chennai to Delhi, the entire two and a half hours, if you measure the, the the wind velocity, it will vary from one location to other location. So it is not a, a smooth velocity. It's not only aircraft. Even if you take the ordinary transports, 
um, road transports, even the ship, if you take the ship, okay, the sea is the sea waves, no interval wave current or wave um, the velocity is varying from one location to other location. Sometimes, some of the area it is a smooth sea, some of the area it is a very um, uh, turbulent sea. Okay, so the velocity will vary because of that. The forces which is acting on the aircraft or ship or the transport vehicle, it will be a varying one. That's why it is called random society. But the before you know, all the aircrafts and the mini critical components are uh, tested using this cycle like, simulated. They will simulate. If you go to uh, HAL, HAL Bangalore and NEL Bangalore, there they have the big uh, uh, test floor for testing the, the entire aircraft. They, they will simulate. They will simulate and they will share, they will see that you know, the, uh, what is the size of life and all those things. So this is very uh, relevant. Relevant means it's a practice. You cannot uh, simulate in the ordinary fatigue test simulation. This random stress cycle you cannot simulate with the ordinary or laboratory scale fatigue test simulation. Right, so the next part is SN curve. So yesterday we have seen one curve, you all remember that. Engineering stress strain curve. Yesterday we discussed about engineering stress strain curve. So here in fatigue, very important as like engineering stress strain curve, here this S N curve. S means stress, N means number of cycles. Okay, S means stress and N means number of cycles. So this, uh, uh, the S N curve, plotting of X N curve, construction of S N curve is very, very important as far as the, you want to evaluate fatigue behavior of a material, okay. So, uh, construction of SN curve is very, very important. It is not like, uh, that's, a, that's a problem with uh, why uh, many people uh, don't work, don't like fatigue means you will get fatigue. You will get fatigue. The, the, those who are working on fatigue will get fatigue because it requires, you know, if you want to, I'll, I'll explain, if you want to construct one SN curve, you need to test at least minimum 10 to 15 specimens you need to test. Minimum, minimum of 15 specimens you have to test to construct one SN curve. But in the uh, engineering stress strain curve, what we need only one specimen. If you have one specimen, each specimen will give one stress strain curve. But here it is not so. That's why the, the testing itself, even in the tensile test, you can finish up within uh, 10 minutes. Okay, 10 to 15 minutes, including loading, unloading, upping the load. You can finish up 15 minutes one specimen, but here one specimen will take even one day. You have to run it for 24 hours. We'll come back to that. So if you want to test some 15 samples, then only you can construct one curve, and it's uh, very very difficult. But if not difficult, it's a time consuming. It's a time consuming. So stress can be in the in the curve, in the SN curve, as I told, no y-axis is stress. And the x-axis is number of cycles. So when the y-axis stress, the stress can be people use uh, alternating stress, maximum stress, minimum stress. Okay, sometimes they use uh, mean stress. Okay, so the also the um, but R should be mentioned. What is the stress ratio or amplitude ratio that should be mentioned in the SN curve? You know, this, as I told you, this is a construction of SN curve normally requires eight to ten specimens. By first testing at high level of stress. So, if you the, the test should be carried out, if you want to start, okay, I have a material. Okay, any any material, you name it. So, for example, um, I am having a uh, high strength aluminum wire, 7075. I have 7075 high strength aluminum wire. I want to find construct SN curve for this high strength uh, 7075 aluminum What I should do? First, I should know what is its tensile properties. Why tensile properties? I should know because if I the, the test should be started at the load, which is yield stress. So I should know what is the yield strength of the material. So if I know the yield strength of the material, you take first specimen, you fix that yield strength. What are the stress? That is yield stress. Under in that stress, you have to test the stress. So second specimen, next specimen, after it fails, reduce the, st the stress, upgrade stress, slightly below. 
20 percent below the yield strength and next first month 40 percent below next first month 60 percent below so like that you have to reduce the stress level when you change this specimen so the first specimen that should be started with high stress level you have to apply very high stress high stress means yield stress what are the yield stress for that you should know what is the yield stress of the material so you know you should know the tensile behavior of the material from there you can start and you have to run you have to conduct the test until the specimen doesn't fail infinite number of cycles okay that we will discuss later so this is a, a graph it's a, maybe the quality of the graph is not so good because i have taken from the book uh, sn curves there are two sn curves here for two different materials one is for the mild steel the top one is for the mild steel ordinary structural steel and bottom one is for the aluminum one and uh, you see that in the x-axis it is number of cycles to failure it is uh, in the y-axis it is the uh, stress maybe bending stress or the water stress it is uh, stress which is acting on this specimen and uh, the x-axis is in the log scale log it's not linear scale it is in the log scale why it is in the log scale because the data is the result number of cycles is the result for an applied load how much cycle you can run so that is it's a, a lot of variation will be there starting from you see that 10 power 5 cycle that means what 1 lakh cycle it, it varies to 10 power even nearer to 10 power 9 so 10 power 7 is 1 crore and 10 power 8 is 10 crore cycles okay so it is a large spectrum of data so if, to accommodate all the data so they are they using uh, the uh, x-axis as the log scale right coming back to this uh, what is the difference you are observing in the mild steel assessments or mild steel you know it's uh, the curve is it is dropping so the first specimen is tested at nearly at 350 megapascal that's the topmost point okay first specimen is tested at 350 300 and 300 in between it is the stress is applied 350 megapascal so 350 megapascal a mild steel number of cycles to failure is how much one lakh 10 power 5 cycle the corresponding cycle the number of cycles in y-axis so 350 in y-axis and the in the mild steel curve you just refer the mild steel curve and 350 is the stress which is acting on this specimen and for the 350 the specimen failed at one lakh cycle after running one lakh cycle okay the same mile still 300 i am reducing from the stress i am reducing it now to 300 megapascal and 300 megapascal what is the stress what is the cycle number of cycle so it is running it is running up to 10 power 5 to 10 power 6 is in the middle that means what it is nearly to 5 lakh cycle after 5 lakh cycle it fails and then you reduce the you reduce further it's a 250 megapascal 250 megapascal it fails at the 10 lakh cycle so 200 if you below that below 250 what happens the curve remains horizontal it remains horizontal what is why it is remain horizontal because what are the stress you apply below that 250 megapascal mild steel will not fail so that stress is known as the fatigue limit or endurance limit or fatigue strength the corresponding stress okay where the curve become horizontal horizontal to the means parallel to the x-axis okay so you do the uh, 10 or 12 or 15 specimens at different stress level you do the test and then you plot the graph okay so one point of time the curve will become horizontal the horizontal means parallel to the x-axis so at the point at which the sn curve becomes parallel to the x-axis that point that point is known as the the fatigue limit point so corresponding stress value is the fatigue strength fatigue strength of the fatigue limit. okay this is possible you can get only in the mild steel but in other material if you take aluminum you see the curve it is grouping it is grouping curve grouping curve means what if the stress is high the number of cycle is low when the stress is reduced okay 300 it is one lakh cycle 200 it is uh, nearly some uh, 50, uh, 50 lakh cycles 
and uh, it's uh, below that it is going down and down and down okay so there is no definite deviation uh, there is the curve is not becoming parallel to the x axis there is no parallel parallel to the x axis why is that ferrous material will give a definite metallic limit but non ferrous materials like aluminum magnesium alloys copper alloys even titanium alloys they will not produce a definite metallic limit okay sir uh, then what how you will find out metallic limit or metallic strength of the material yes there is a criteria people have proposed many criteria okay even in the steels no some of the steels they will not give definite metallic limit okay so what they will do they will take as the <clears throat> some criteria they will fix criteria like uh, okay 1 into 10 power 7 1 into 10 power 7 means what one crore cycle okay one crore cycle so <clears throat> how what is the stress okay that will the, the material will be stacked to run up to 10 power so first you construct the curve sm curve then you take in the x axis you note down the 10 power 7 10 power 7 is one crore cycle and draw a vertical line parallel to the y axis vertical line okay where it intersect where it intersect in the sm curve in the aluminum alloy if you see that it intersect at the 200 nearer to the 200 190 mega pascal 190 mega pascal so 190 is the 190 mega pascal is the kinetic strength of the this aluminum alloy okay so like that you have to interpret so you have to fix 10 power 7 some people know they will fix even 10 power 8 10 power we need it depends on the application application of the copper or it is so 10 power 7 or 10 power 8 they will fix and suppose for the aluminum alloy if the the uh, the, the, uh, the user requires i need metallic strength uh, even at 10 power 8 cycle so 10 power it means 10 power cycle so 10 power cycle if you draw a vertical line where it intersects is almost 250 mega sorry 150 mega pascal the metallic strength of the aluminum alloy for 10 power so 10 power 7 cycle a 10 power 8 cycle this is be given by the user okay the user means who is going to use the material okay so they will they will ask this is my requirement so for the requirement you have to test and give the results right this is one case because we are now we are uh, and we are well known for uh, welding so welding welded joints welded joints it is uh, it is difficult to run up to one crore cycle normally it will fail uh, well below the uh, one crore cycle so for the welded joints they use 2 into 10 power 6 cycle 2 into 10 power 6 2 million 2 million cycles so 20 lakh cycle 20 lakh cycle what is the stress so that is the critic strength or critic limit or endurance limit of the so this is the usefulness of the sl curve why what is their the usefulness you can find out petit limit that means what below the stress below the petit limit stress or below the endurance stress the specimen never fails due to the cyclic loading okay so you you should be you should below this it is the safe region below the curve it is the same region okay and above this curve it is the unsafe region so that is the another inference you will get from this graph below this Okay, below this, whatever the stress you take below this curve, it will it will not fail. But above this, the specimen will fail. Right. So whatever I explained, no. Again, coming back to that. So fatigue, uh, its uh, failure will occur at high number of cycles. Based on the number of cycles to failure, the fatigue is. classified into two types one is the high cycle fatigue other one is low cycle fatigue high cycle fatigue is more than greater than 10 power 5 cycles 1 lakh cycles more than 1 lakh cycle if the failure occurs it is called the high cycle fatigue what is low cycle fatigue normally it is less than 10000 cycles the failure will occur less than 10000 cycles 10 power 4 or sometimes less than 1 lakh cycles so based on this number of cycles to failure the fatigue is classified into high cycle fatigue hcf and low cycle fatigue as lcf 
Okay, if your specimen fails under the cyclic loading at thousand cycles, then it is low cycle failure, low cycle critic failure. If if your if your material fails after uh, uh, fifty lakh cycles, then it is high cycle. Failure. So n increases with the decreasing the stress level. It's obvious because if you reduce the stress acting on the specimen, acting on the material, definitely number of cycles will increase. So as I told, no fatigue limit or endurance limit is normally defined at 10 power 7 or 10 power 8 cycle. It is based on the user's requirement. And non-ferrous metals do not have fatigue limit. And the, uh, the ferrous materials will have a definite fatigue limit. Uh, fatigue strength normally it is defined as 10 power 8 cycle. 10, 10 power 7 or 10 power 8, as I told, no. For this is for unwelded material, fine materials. For welded materials, welded joints, this criteria is 10 power 2 into 10 power 6. 2 into 10 power 6. And that's enough for the welded joints. Because welding, welding already introduced a lot of stresses, a lot of stress concentration, even a lot of um, micro pores, porosities will be there. So uh, this even it's a 2, 2 million cycle if the joint can be used, that's enough. Right, so uh, the, there is one equation which is uh, properly used for uh, uh, estimating or evaluating the fatigue life of the uh, material. So it is given by, proposed by vascular equation. If this equation is applicable only for the high cycle fatigue region, not for the low cycle fatigue region. So this graph is combined of low cycle fatigue and high cycle fatigue. High cycle fatigue means what? Number of cycles very high. Okay, at the same time, stress acting on this person is very big. So, low cycle fatigue is number of cycles low, number of cycles smaller, and the, the stress acting on the component is very high. So, for this region, okay, this high cycle fatigue region, it is a sloping curve. Okay, if you have your constant slope, so find out what is the slope of the curve and what is the intercept of the curve, as I told yesterday, for two stress, two strain curve here also. You have to find out the, um, the the slope and the intercept of the curve. As it all know, it is a log log flag, it's axis log log, and y also you can take log log. And the equation is not linear equation, it is a power equation. Y equal to x power m into c. C is the kind of intercept, that's a constant. So you take here. So n is the number of cycle, and um, sigma is the, uh, the alternating stress. P the small p, p is the intercept, the slope of this curve at the high cyclic fatigue region, and the, the c is the intercept of the fatigue. So, it, this small p and capital C are the material constant. It will vary from material to material. Okay, for mild steel, it will have one value, for aluminum, it will have another value, for magnesium, it will have another value. That you need to evaluate by conducting the test and then constructing the, the, the SM curve. The slope of the SM curve is the P, and the intercept of the SM curve is the C. Okay, so if you substitute in this equation, so Yang, you keep Yang this side and tuck this term stress uh, stress term to the right side. C by sigma Y or P that will give the. So you know what is the stress acting, what is the the material constant P and C. If you know that, then number of cycles can be determined. Uh, estimated using this vascular equation. And uh, the construction of SM curves, as you all know, it's a uh, um, lot of scatters. Why, if you see this curve, a lot of scatters. Why a lot of scatters, as you all know, that's why you know people even at one stress level, they will test 10 specimens. Actually, if you want to uh, construct a SM curve, that is a procedure. Okay, for one stress level, suppose for 100, 100 megapascal, you have to test at least minimum five five specimens under itself. Okay, so you will get hundred different values. But normally it is uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the academic institution. No? It is very very difficult to test at each stress level by normally we do two or three specimens at each stress level. Then we will take the average of the three specimens, three data, and they will be constant. But actually, if you see that you have to do hundreds of specimens and each stress level you have to do five specimens and each specimen will give a different readings, different values. So it is a lot of scatter is involved. So that's a, you require a statistical approach. So in this graph will explain you know, what is the statistical involved. Okay. So this is uh, if you take uh, the stress sigma one, okay, sigma one, 
the first curve. Okay, these are all SN curves. These are all SN curves. So sigma one is what a particular stress. For a particular stress, you see that if the probability is 0.01, 0.01 means what? It is the 99 percent. Um, okay, so that is the life is you see n one. The n one is the corresponding stress. Rate. So the next curve, the you see that next curve. The, the red line is the average, you know, 0.5, 0.5. 50 percent of this would be expected to probability is 0.5 here. Uh, probability is 0.5 here. So that is for that sigma one, the number of cycles is n two. So the probability will vary. This is 99 percent. This is 90 percent, and this is um, the what do you call it? This is the 99 here, 90 here, and uh, <coughs> It will keep on based on the probability. It will keep on varying. So it is a lot of scatters involved, and you have to apply some statistical procedures to construct the actual system. But normally, no academic people we do we, we don't do all those things, and we do each stress level. We do the three stress levels, and we take the okay average. We will take and we will construct the system. Okay, and the. Uh, Coming back to the, this is, okay, you know, there are a few graphs I am uh, displaying here to understand what is the effect of this, uh, uh, some of the parameters, mean stress. What is mean stress? It is nothing but average stress, maximum plus minimum by two, it's a mean stress. What is the stress range? It's not stress range actually, it's the stress ratio. <clears throat> okay, the first graph, if there's the first graph, it is the showing the effect of mean stress. Effect of mean stress. Effect of mean stress, if you see that, this is the sigma M4 is the highest mean stress. M3 is slightly lower, M2 is slightly lower, and the M1 is lowest one. So M4 is highest mean stress, and M1 is the lowest mean stress. So if the mean stress is low, the life will be higher. That is okay. The mean stress is low, the life will be higher. If the mean stress is sorry, so the mean stress is higher. Um, one minute. So sigma M four is the highest stress, greater stress. So you see the life is lower, and the sigma M one, well, the minimum stress, the life will be. Higher. So that is explained here. Mean stress is higher and predict strength will be lower. That's obvious. If stress is high, the stress which is acting on this person is high, the predict life will be lower. And in the second graph, it is uh, drawn for the effect of stress ratio, not the stress range. It's a mistake. R, R is what? Stress ratio. So stress ratio, you know that. <coughs> stress ratio is what? It is the minimum stress by maximum stress. You see that. Stress ratio is varying from R is varying from minus 1, minus point, uh, 1, point 0.3, 0, point 0.3, plus point 0.3. So if the stress ratio is increasing, okay, stress ratio increases means what? The range is higher. The range is higher. If the range is higher, again the critic strength will be reduced here. And the last graph it is if you introduce a notch in the material, if you introduce a notch. It may be V notch, it may be U notch, what are the notch if you introduce in the material that will definitely reduce the fatigue strength or fatigue life of the problem. Because yesterday also I told notches will introduce the, will act as the stress rises. Okay, stress rises. So they will act as the, the stress will be intensified at the tip of the notch. So stress will be magnified at the tip of the notch. Because of that, the life will be reduced there. So this is uh, for uh, KT. KT is nothing but uh, theoretical stress concentration, and that is uh, you can get it from the maximum stress divided by normal stress or average stress. If you know the maximum stress and the average stress, you can get the theoretical stress concentration. So that also not just will reduce the stress intensity is high, fatigue life will be lower. Right, and the next part is uh, sir. Uh, you hear, no, you hear about this diagram, Zipman diagram or the Soderberg diagram. Uh, I don't know how many of you understood uh, fully about this diagram. It is a very 
um, very very useful diagram as far as the design is concerned. So what is this diagram? So it is x-axis and y-axis both are stress. Okay, x-axis also stress, y-axis also stress. X-axis we are taking mean stress. Mean stress you know that average stress. Delta maximum plus delta sorry sigma max plus sigma minimum by two is the mean stress. What is the alternating stress? This is the range of stress sigma max minus sigma minimum by two. Okay. We we'll try to remember that. But that's why I introduced all these things in the beginning. Mean stress is average. Alternative stress is range. Range you are bit. So x-axis is mean stress and y-axis is alternative stress. What you should do? This is uh, all. No, it's a it's a phenomenon. You can say it's a philosophy or you can say it's a criteria. Criteria. So uh, initially, the uh, good man, good man only proposed this diagram. So he took in the x-axis. So you take a material, okay? What are the materials so for arsenic stainless steel? Yes, yes arsenic stainless steel. So arsenic stainless steel for arsenic stainless steel, I I know I should have tensile properties, okay? What is the yield strength? What is the ultimate tensile strength? I should. Know. Similarly, after doing fatigue test, I will get what is the fatigue strength, is, fatigue limitus, okay? So these data are required. I require only two data for the Goodman line. One is the ultimate tensile strength, and other one is the fatigue strength. Okay, fatigue limit or fatigue strength. So for that material, what are the material it is? What are the material? I should know these two. So for getting these two data, I should do fatigue test. I should do the tensile test. If we do tensile test, I'll get ultimate tensile strength. If I do fatigue test, I'll get the endurance limit or fatigue limit. So what Goodman proposed with the mean stress, you take the the limit is the ultimate tensile strength is the maximum point and the, the alternating stress the maximum stress is allowable stress maximum allowable stress is the fatigue strength or fatigue limit or endurance limit whatever you say we all say fatigue limit endurance limit fatigue strength everything is same okay that means what below which below that stress level whatever the stress you apply the specimen never fails it will run for infinite number of cycles that is the the infant that's a, that's a meaning of endurance limit or fatigue limit. So you take the endurance limit one side in y axis and the tensile strength in the x axis and connect by a straight line. Below this line, below the good band line, below the good band line, he told that whatever mean stress, whatever the operating stress you select, you apply on the material or the component, it will not fail. But if it is above this Goodman line, any stress level, what are the stress? So I know in the fatigue design, I know what is the maximum stress going to act, what is the minimum stress going to act. So if I know maximum stress, minimum stress, I can calculate mean stress, I can calculate alternating stress. So I can find out where is the point is. So if the point is below the Goodman line, it is safe. Okay. If it is above the Goodman line, it is unsafe. Unsafe means what you have to do? What do you have to do? We have to do. We have to reduce the stress. We have to bring the stress below the Goodman line. What we have to do for bringing the stress? We have to increase the component size. We have to increase the dimensions. Okay. So that is the method we use. So Goodman proposed that it is a straight line. You connect ultimate strength and the endurance strength. But um, the Gerber, some of the metallurgists, he proposed no, no. It is not falling on the straight line. Not governed by the straight line. It is a lot of scatters are there in, in the pity. So you are the he connected by a parabola. Connected by a parabola. Parabola means what? The safe region is increased. Safe region is widened when compared to good man. Then later on, Soderberg he proposed no, 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 we, we no need to go beyond the it's, 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 uh, it's unfair uh, to test you to uh, relate the tensile strength and the uh, pity strength. You have to relate only yield strength because even in the static loading condition, you are taking yield stress as a design stress and you have to connect only with the yield stress. So, so sigma naught is yield strength in x axis and it is connected to the, all the uh, endurance strength, that's a fatigue strength. So it is in connecting between fatigue strength and the yield strength. So now what happened, you see that the safe region is minimized when compared to Gerber, Gerber is wider safe region. And the uh, Goodman line, it is the still slightly reduced and sort of further reduced. The safe region is 
So this triangle, the dotted triangle, within the triangle, your mean stress is falling in this triangle. Within the triangle, the, this component is safe. If the, the stress which is acting on the component is it's a, well above the solar belt line, then it is component is unsafe. So to find out whether your component is under safe condition, safe mode or unsafe mode, these diagrams can be used. So this is the one work we did for the Fuchs's Chirvalde Giant. So we, do, we did a lot of work on the FSW. So this is for the aluminum alloy, the green line, similar giant. Aluminum with aluminum we joined and tested. And it is the this is the fatigue strength and this is the, the tensile strength, sorry, yield strength of the, sorry, tensile strength because it's a Goodman diagram, tensile strength. And this is below this aluminum joint, the safe region is this below the green line, the below the blue line. For magnesium alloy, we did the magnesium alloys also be welded using a FSW process. And for magnesium alloy, this is the 20 megapascal is the fatigue strength and 100 megapascal is the tensile strength. We connected this. So magnesium alloy joints, okay, they are safe below the this blue line. Okay, there is a good man line. We are we also joined aluminum with magnesium, dissimilar time. Okay, we joined aluminium with magnesium using FSW process. For the joint, we evaluated fatigue strength. Fatigue strength is only 50 mega, 50 mega Pascal, and the tensile strength is 80 mega Pascal. So for a dissimilar joint, so the safe region is under this curve. It's a safe region. I mentioned more pink color. The pink color region is the safe region. So above this safe region, what are the point, the stresses acting, mean stress, and other than the joint is unsafe region. You have to reduce the stress. Either you have to reduce the stress or you have to increase the dimensions of the stress. That's the usefulness of this Goodman diagram. And uh, this is the equation. You can, uh, that, that, that equation, that's, uh, these that lines are uh, governed by, okay, Goodman line, total the line, herbal formula that can be expressed, governed by this equation. Only the x will, be, will vary, sigma max by sigma mean by sigma u, this is the endurance stress, this is the operating stress. Operating stress is given by fatigue stress, 1 minus is the mean stress divided by ultimate stress. Good morning, Goodman diagram, Goodman relationship. In that x is 1 for Goodman line, and the Gerber, it is for the Gerber parabola, it is the 2 for the Gerber, for Gerber formula. Right, so the next part is, uh, whatever we discussed so far, it is the high cycle fatigue. Another aspect is the low cycle fatigue. So for low cycle fatigue, even, even it is uh, complicated compared to the high cycle fatigue. The advantage of low cycle fatigue is the, the test will be completed in a short period compared to the high cycle. High cycle fatigue it will take hours, days to do that. If I want to construct an SN curve for a material, I should be, I should do the test for one 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 month. Okay. I should do, I, I need to do the testing for one month because I want to test at least, I don't know, 10 to 12 specimens. Each specimen will run for one day. Even some specimen at low stress level will run for two days also. So one month, after one month only, I will have 10 data or 12 data. 12 specimens, I, I, I can complete 12 specimens in one month. So for constructing one SN curve, I need to do the test <coughs> one month completely. So, but the low cycle fatigue is slightly faster, slightly faster. How, how we can see that, as I told you, the low cycle fatigue is what? The number of cycles to failure is less than, lower than 10,000 cycles. So, 10,000 cycles is very less frequent. Maybe within a week time, you can do that. <coughs> right, so the, uh, this graph, this curve, it's a cyclic stress strain curve. So, we know about the, uh, original stress time curve, engineering stress time curve, what we discussed yesterday. But this is a cyclic stress time curve. Because there, yesterday, I discussed only tensile load, <coughs> tensile stress alone. But here, not only the tensile stress, it is the compressive stress also applied here. So here it is, um, you see that it's uh, initially, we start from O. That's origin, origin. We are upping the load and it reaches A, the point A where yielding starts. And then we are stressing, we are straining the material 
to the point B. Okay, at the point B, it is the initial stress strain curve. So if I leave this, if I release the load at point B, what will happen? <coughs> the specimen will slightly, you know, it will come back to its uh, zero. That the stress will become zero. But because of this training from A to B, okay, from O to A, it's a elastic limit. A to B is the plastic limit. So because I stress the specimen, strain the specimen in the plastic limit, even if I release the load, okay, the specimen come back to the zero. Zero means what? The stress is zero. There is a some amount of strain. Strain is left. That is known as the plastic strain. Right. After reaching this x-axis, again I am stressing it. I am again stressing it in the reverse direction. Reverse means what? In the reverse direction means Compressive load. I am applying the compressive load. Now, what happens from here, from B, it reaches this x-axis. From x-axis, it is coming down to C. C means what? There, that's a yield. That's a yield is the deformation is taking place in the compressive mode. So it starts here and reaches a point here at the end of point. And then again, if you release the load. The specimen will come back to its here this position, but there is some amount of strain is left in the compressive mode. And then you again you stress it to reach the point B. So like this, if you do that, you will get a loop. It's a hysteresis loop. You will get a loop continuously. So you have to take O to A elastic limit, A to B plastic, unload it, and when you unload it, it will come back to uh, the zero stress condition, but there will be some amount of strain. That is the deformation, pulling. So pulling, some elongation has taken place, and then from there you apply the compressive load, and then you, after reaching that point, this so D actually is missing here. If you reach that point D, if you release the load again, it will come back to x-axis. But here, what happens? It is the result because of compressive load. It is crushed. It is compressed. It is pushed. So the dimension is reduced with the minus one, and from there again you go for the tensile load. So like that you can do repeatedly. So there is a, a elastic strain in this region is elastic strain and the total strain is given by the elastic region uh, uh, epsilon delta E epsilon, epsilon E and uh, delta E epsilon P. So that is the total strain in the specimen. So this total strain is used for the this is one cycle. Actually this is one cycle for the LCF. When you do the LCF, so this LCF is what low cycle fatigue is strain control. The HCF is what it's a stress control. You are controlling the stress. Controlling stress means what you are fixing the stress 200 megapascal to 50 megapascal. Maximum stress is 200. Minimum stress is 50 megapascal. You are fixing the stress, but in the low cycle fatigue, you have to fix the strain. What is the strain? What is the displacement? That you have to fix. Point one. 0.125. So you have to fix the strain in terms of strain. It's a strain control. So you require you cannot do low cycle fatigue in the high cycle fatigue machine. Okay. So you need a different machine. You need a separate machine for doing the low cycle fatigue. Low cycle fatigue machines are strain control machines. Maybe tomorrow I'll I'll I'll, I'll give that photographs and other things. So low cycle fatigue you require strain control fatigue testing machine. For high cycle fatigue you require stress control. Fatigue estimation. So you can't do the high cycle fatigue in uh, low, cycle, low cycle fatigue machine or low cycle fatigue in high cycle fatigue. So this is a uh, again like a SM curve. This is another curve. It is the stress as uh, the uh, low cycle fatigue uh, curve. Strain versus number of cycles to failure. Okay, change in strain y axis. Okay, this is the uh, given here. No delta epsilon. That is the Total strain, total strain range, total strain range is in the x axis, the y axis, and number of cycles to failure is in the x axis. You see that the all the specimens, almost all the specimens fail below the 1 lakh cycle. So this curve is governed by an equation again here, and the C and the, the, the C is the intercept of the fatigue that will be excellent, varies from 0.5 to 0.7. And the delta epsilon p is the strain range in plastic, and it's a, it's a the n is number of uh, cycles to failure, and it is uh, epsilon p by two is plastic strain amplitude, 
and by this is the equation for this curve, governing equation for this. So another equation is uh, strain life equation. You can calculate this uh, like a Pascal equation for high cycle fatigue. And here in the, that is an elastic, here it is the plastic medium. Using this equation, you can evaluate the life of the cycle, life of the component. And finally, it is the uh, fatigue uh, strain life curve. It is uh, nothing but it's a combination of, uh, you see that you have the, this is the low cycle fatigue curve, plastic. Plastic is here, and it's, um, it's a low cycle fatigue. Plastic, the curve which is arrow. Sorry for interrupting. You told me to remind you. Yeah, yes. This is the last slide. <laughs> I, I am on time. So this is the for plastic, it is the, uh, the low cycle fatigue curve. And the elastic, which is mentioned as the elastic, it is in the high cycle fatigue curve. So in the low cycle fatigue, there is a dimension, changes in dimensions, changes in shape, changes in because it is a plastic deformation. But in the high cycle fatigue, there is no change in the dimension because it is the stress is acting well below the yield stress. So this difference you should understand. So high cycle fatigue, the complete high cycle fatigue is under the elastic region only because we are not exceeding yield point. We are not exceeding yield point. Okay, below the yield point only we are doing all the stress, all the tests. But in high, since the low cycle fatigue, we are straining the material. Okay, you see here, you are straining the material and you are getting this changes, strain. Okay, elastic strain and plastic strain. We are getting that. So because of that, the plastic deformation, there is a change in the dimension of this component or the material after the, uh, the low cycle fatigue. So these two curves will intersect, where it is intersecting, that point is known as the, the that is the uh, critical point and uh, you can get the ductile materials, high cycle strain conditions and the strong materials, low cycle strain conditions and fatigue life values at this transition will occur using this formula you can find out what is the life of the cycle, life of the component is that you can find out. And uh, this, this is about uh, fatigue behavior, I am on time. So yesterday, no, I didn't have time to uh, answer for uh, questions. So that's why I, I asked Dr. Dinagar to uh, uh, use some time, at least 10 to 15 minutes, to uh, give any uh, interactions or queries. Or, uh, this is my email ID and the mobile number. And you can contact me uh, for any doubt or any clarification. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. The uh, the toughest one, what we feel is uh, uh, drawing yesan curve yeah. interpretation. So it's uh, explained very nicely. And uh, let me uh, uh, request our participants, those who want to clear the doubt with VP, sir, you can raise your hands if you, have, if you have proper connectivity. I can allow you also to in live to uh, interact with him. So if you have proper connectivity, you can come on live. And, and meanwhile, I take the questions, sir, uh, which are yeah. posted at the chat box. Uh, 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 Professor Dr. Leibar has asked one question. Yeah. Though it is a uh, fatigue uh, class, uh, as uh, fatigue very okay. So he appreciated. So even though it is a fatigue class, he nicely uh, uh, all the information have been given. Uh, yes, appreciated. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Actually, I need uh, five hours to whatever I cover. No, in the class, no, I used to take five classes uh, uh, because so here I have to. Uh, there we I use board board also, board board also. Okay, sir. So I, I will uh, give some problems also. So I normally I will take uh, five hours to cover whatever I covered today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Mr. Navin Venkat had asked one question. Mm -hmm. Sir, can you tell some practical examples of uh, examples for low cycle fatigue? Low cycle fatigue, it's very common. So wherever you go for high temperature applications, okay, uh, any boiler applications and um, uh, gas turbine applications, wherever the high temperature is involved, the low cycle fatigue is very, very important. If you go to um, uh, very near, no, Kalpakam, IGK, Indra Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, 
they are working on high temperature materials they work only on high temperature they will not work on aluminum alloys they will not work on uh, magnesium alloys because there is no use they are working on austenitic stainless steel they are working on uh, super nickel based alloys to some extent they are also working on the titanium alloys because the reason is they are operating the operating temperature of the boilers gas turbines and the heat gen uh, 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 heat generator everything no turbines it's a high temperature they are operating at 600 degree 550 degrees centigrade so they know the temperature will fluctuate because when it is in the uh, the off load condition the temperature will be low and there's maximum surge condition the, the, the temperature will reach maximum so the temperature will fluctuate in the components those components involved in the thermal power stations nuclear power stations wherever temperatures involved it is one example and we like that so there are many examples are there and even if you go to the nlc they will like the thermal power station they are also this fluctuation in temperature thermal that will cause the deformation of the material that's why they are interested in if you ask icc uh, people they are not interested in high cyclic fatigue they don't want high cyclic fatigue at all because the the, the temperature fluctuation no because of that it is operating temperature high the stress in the stresses are which is acting on above the yield point so they are interested in low cyclic fatigue and they are interested in the creep behavior so you will see the creep behavior so wherever temperature fluctuation is there this low cyclic fatigue is very very important yes sir thank you sir thank you sir yeah. and uh, uh, mr sridama chandran uh, veeravalli asked one question mm. uh, sir uh, ka, Uh, is it possible to conclude high cycle fatigue is better and more related to the durability durability is concerned high cycle fatigue is uh, shall we conclude the high cycle fatigue is better and more related to the uh, durability is concerned durability yes sir yeah it is it's a durability only it's endurance the name itself no it is a fatigue limit the endurance limit Uh, everything suggests that it is the durability of the fatigue. How much? How much? How much time it will endure? It's a durability only. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank the you. only thing is the loading is different. Loading here, yeah, the loading is cyclic load. We are testing against the durability of the material. We are testing against the cyclic load. That's all. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Sir. Thank you. another question uh, mr amrin taj asked one question mm. uh, sir can you give some idea about to find the sn co for natural fiber composites natural fiber composites yeah. okay see the uh, uh, what are the material it is only thing is i, I forgot to give the asm uh, there is a standard for the high cycle fatigue uh, maybe tomorrow i'll give that it's uh, Uh, that standard you need to follow, and uh, normally no uh, the uh, high cycle fatigue specimens they, they will be like no it is a what do you call it um, um, like it almost like a tensile specimen so okay? slight variation in the uh, dimensions of that almost like a tensile specimen uh, it is like hour glass we used to say it in the hour glass specimen you hear about hour glass specimen right hour hour glass. Uh, it's a, there is a, a top wider and the bottom also wider. In between there is a narrow region. So we have to prepare our glass specimen. If it is the cylindrical, the round rods, if it is the you can prepare our glass specimens. Or if you are having only sheet specimen, again there is a, a dimensions are there. Uh, I'll, maybe I will show the uh, dimensions I will give tomorrow. You have to prepare like a tensile specimen only. Even uh, like a tensile specimens, you have to prepare the specimen. If you are able to prepare the specimens, then you can. Test in this uh, machines. Machines are capable of doing that. Only thing is, you have to. You should know what is the uh, strength of the material. So you do the test well below the strength of the material, and you can vary the frequency. In the nowadays, no, so the uh, servo hydraulic machines have come. They can, you can vary the frequency of the material, frequency of the testing. Also, we can vary stress ratio. We can vary. So there are many advancement have come in the uh, testing machine is concerned. So it's it is not not much uh, difference between the alloys or the composites or the uh, to the the uh, uh, what do you call whatever you told us uh, the compost material. There is no difference. Only difference is the values will be lower. That's all. 
values will be lower and some of the composites are giving better results than the the alloys alloys and the uh, alloys if they are giving better aesthetic strength aesthetic life they are giving better so same procedure the procedure is same thank you sir thank you sir and uh, miss aishwarya asked one question mm -hmm. uh, sir does the plastic show any kind of aesthetic limit does plastic show any kind of aesthetic limit for lcm she is asking uh, yes, sir nothing she has mentioned uh, uh, generally she has asked the question okay so what repeat the question sir does uh, plastic show any kind of aesthetic limit oh okay plastic material she is asking about plastic material okay yeah it, 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 it will also show the aesthetic limit plastic materials also will have the aesthetic limit there is a law as i told no all the materials you can test you can test for ceramics you can test for the plastics you can test for the composites and you can test for alloys but there is each material will have its own the endurance limit or aesthetic limit so it all depends on how much load you are applying how much load you are applying and what is the loading condition what is the stress acting on the tablet this will decide this will decide thank you sir thank you sir uh mr gk kanan ask one question mm. sir will the resources uh cause the fatigue failure especially in tick welding process uh, repeat the question will the resources uh cause the fatigue failure especially in tick welding yes yeah the residual stress no it is uh maybe i'll take tomorrow i will tell that so residual stress definitely will influence the fatigue life fatigue behavior of the material residual stress you have again you have two parts one is the tensile residual stress and compressive residual stress okay so the residual stress is what it is the internal stress internal stress that the residual stress in the petty the tensile mode of the residual stress will will accelerate the petty crack i think once the crack is initiated due to the repeated stress cycle the crack is accelerated crack growth crack growth is accelerated by the tensile residual stress but compressive we have compressive residual stress okay if we have compressive residual stress the crack will be closed partially closed not fully partially closed that means what the compressive residual stress field will decelerate its opposite decelerate the petty crack growth so that's why even in our uh, the stress cycle i don't know why they are not included the what you call the uh, the compressive mode why they are since they are not considered why it is not significant because compressive stress field is beneficial for improving the petit strength of the material compressive compressive stress or compressive resistances whatever it is compressive so if you take you no know, for example thick welding thick welding the weld region weld metal region will have very high tensile resistances okay at the same time if you take friction stress welding the steel zone will have lowest very low tensile resistances because in stress welding well, we are applying the the axial force downward force okay forging force we are applying down so the compressive uh, the, the the tensile stress left out in the steel zone is Lower when compared to the thick welding. In thick welding, the weld metal region will have very high magnitude of tensile stress. That magnitude of tensile stress will accelerate the fatigue life. So fatigue life will be poor in the conventional <coughs> conventional joints, conventional welding work. Whether it is thick welding, thick welding, semi W, will be uh, very lower. But compared to thick welding and semi W welding, thick welding will give better because Thick welding is considered to be the somewhat a clean weld. It's considered to be the clean weld. So it will give the for the porosity, micro pores. Those things are very very less in the case of thick weld joints. So the that effect will be uh, compared to thick welding, SMW welding. Thick welding will give better fatigue life. But whatever it may be, the weld region will have tensile resistances. The tensile resistances will accelerate the fatigue crack. So the the static life and static strength will be lower. The fusion of the time. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Karthi and asked one question about uh, resources. Mm. And I think tomorrow you will be dealing with that. Mm. Uh, he asked something about removal of resources in uh, past polymers. Oh. And I hope tomorrow you will be coming. Yes, sir. Yeah, removal of uh, stresses, sir. Yes, sir. Removal of residual stress in polymers. Polymers. Okay. That I, I don't have much idea about uh, polymers. Uh, but uh, the alloys and metals and alloys, there are many methods out there. Uh, people use uh, short peeling. Short peeling is one method. Even the, uh, the laser peeling also people are using to do the uh, residual stresses. Uh, about polymers, I don't have much idea, but polymers also you can do short peeling. Short peeling uh, is uh, you can apply, short peeling can be applied to any material. That that, well, that is the one way you know you can uh, reduce the industrial stresses. Uh, sir, are you able to hear me, sir? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Fine, sir. Fine, sir. Uh, next, I look into the next question. Uh, participants, those who want to clarify doubts, you can post uh, your questions. And because of uh, because to carry your questions only, it was uh, please uh, complete earlier. So you can throw it our questions. Sir, uh, oh. Mr. Mani had asked a question. Ah, yes. uh, sir, how to overcome fatigue failures uh, for mild steel and uh, stainless steel? See, it's uh, <laughs> fatigue failure you cannot uh, avoid. Okay, it's it's uh, very difficult to avoid. Only thing is no. Um, uh, if you if you know the fatigue strength or fatigue life of the material, then you can re replace the component. What is the what is the importance of this fatigue fatigue life evaluation, fatigue strength evaluation, or this Goodman diagram or so on and so What is the use to avoid the failure? Avoid the failure means as I told no, this fatigue failure will occur suddenly. It will not show any indication, it will not show any warning, especially the high cyclic fatigues. Because no, there is no plastic deformation, there is no change in the dimension, there is no change, it will not show any warning. Okay. So because of that, it will occur anytime. So to avoid that, they are going, they are, they are uh, evaluating this. And uh, this, uh, maybe tomorrow I will take a pretty crack work. There is a concept called remaining life assessment. Okay, remaining life assessment. Okay, this boiler has run for 10 years. What is its remaining life? Whether we can run for another 5 years or another 10 years, how we evaluate it. So they will do this critique testing and they will, they will find out what is the remaining life. Remaining life you can evolve it. So it is uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to avoid. But when you can avoid, if the stress is well below the endurance limit, fatigue limit, then you can avoid. So you should see that. You design the component well below the fatigue limit, fatigue strength. So, like in the factor of safety here, you use the endurance limit divided by n factor of safety. Use the factor of safety and you apply in the design, and you will not expect any fatigue factor. Because fatigue limit itself, that's the, um, uh, the um, maximum stress below which. The material will not fail. That is the, um, the definition for critical limit or critical stress or endurance limit. Okay, that's the maximum stress you can apply to run the component without any failure. Infinite number of cycles. Infinite number of cycles. So in that critical life, critical limit, endurance limit, that you divide it. Critical limit is what is the stress? It is a stress. Y axis is stress always. So the stress you apply the impact of the That stress divided by impact of the four, six. 8 based on the criticality of the number, you apply this 2, 4, 6, 8, you apply and find out the value that is the design stress for the cyclic mode. If you use factor of P and if you uh, then there will not be any problem, the failure will not happen. You can if you run for as it all knows, uh, uh, 10 power 9, even uh, 10 power cycles also do that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Vijay Umar, MD Vijay Umar asked one question. Mm. Uh, sir, does fatigue behavior impact on cryogenic conditions? Cryogenic condition? Yes. Yeah. 
yeah it is it is uh, very difficult to evaluate uh, because so the yes it is definitely the temperature no the, the the problem is what is the problem the material which will undergo transition through ductic to brittle transition okay all the materials that the ferrous materials okay ferrous materials will undergo ductile to brittle transition okay you know that at room temperature they are ductile at uh, uh, below sub zero temperature minus 20 minus 40 minus 60 they become brittle so the brittle materials the fatigue life is very poor okay once it become brittle the fatigue life is very poor but in the non ferrous materials like aluminum alloys copper alloys nickel based alloys titanium alloys so they will not undergo ductile to brittle transition so when they don't undergo ductile to brittle transition so there is no so the fatigue failure will occur but not big change there will not be a big change but uh, yeah, so far no i i didn't come across the uh, fatigue life on, under the cryogenic conditions because the uh, it is maintaining the conditions for the uh, long period no you have to maintain the temperature if i want to test at minus 60 degree at minus 60 degree i want to maintain for uh, one specimen to fail no i have to at least i have to maintain for 6 hours or 12 hours but ferrous materials definitely the uh, the, uh, the sub zero temperature low temperature real big temperature the fatigue life will be very very poor because the cryogenic temperature the duct the ferrous materials like uh, carbon steel uh, also it is stainless steel cast iron they all undergo the transformation ductile to brittle transformation so they become brittle below certain temperature minus 40 minus 60 they become brittle so they definitely the fatigue property will be very very poor for non ferrous alloys they will not undergo this transformation okay only slight change slight change in the ductile to brittle transition and because of that the fatigue life will be good on the periodic complex also for the non ferrous alloys yes sir thank you sir thank you i think mr manoj kumar has asked one question mm. i think uh, uh, sir uh, uh, basic question why sir why only the ferrous alloy have fatigue limit why uh, oil non ferrous alloy does not have any fatigue limit yeah that's why i told no it's uh, not, not only the ferrous alloys okay as i told yesterday also i told it's uh, similar you can see no some of the similarity between tensile behavior and fatigue behavior in tensile behavior also the yield point definite yield point you will get only on few alloys like low carbon steels even for mild steel you will not get the definite yield point similarly here for the even for the ferrous alloys only few materials like low carbon steels where there as a told no low carbon steel why low carbon steel it is a interstitial elements are there carbon nitrogen these things are there so they create that some variations striations okay and uh, the in the, the material that that is that is uh, seen in the uh, in the in the what you call it the stress strain graph but here we are not um, um, seeing that we are not seeing any fluctuation with graph in the curve because it's not a one curve many stress when you are testing and then you are connecting so you see that below particular temperature or particular stress level the specimen is not failing so for example you take mild steel mild steel it will not fail if you apply 100 mega pascal stress it will not fail it will run for one crore cycle 10 crore cycle then there is no point running beyond that okay so they will people will stop and they will go but aluminum alloys it will where what are the stress if you reduce the stress if the life will be increased that's all it will going up the reason is Uh, there are many reasons maybe the presence of carbon presence of carbides these are the reasons they will uh, there is a cracking will undergo in the material carbon carbide particles will crack in the ferrous material but here in the case of uh, non ferrous alloys carbides are not 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 many in the carbides carbides will not be there and only if you do some heat treatment the precipitates will pop even carbon is not a not there in the So here mainly this carbon, nitrogen, boron, these interstitial elements play a role. They 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 make a 
second phase particles the second phase particles will crack because the second phase particles are brittle they will crack under the repeated stress cycling because of the crack in shades the the failure is occurring easily in the in the, the ferrous material but not in the case of non ferrous material not only this there is another thing it is the tracking for energy so um, the ferrous materials mostly the ferrous materials are in the uh, bcc except the uh, what do you call the uh, aesthetic stainless steel is only the scc all other uh, uh, the uh, steels are comes under the um, uh, bcc body center cubic crystal but most of the uh, non ferrous alloys aluminum alloys after and this alloys falls under the scc or scp structure the stacking fault energy we used to say in the metal we used to say stacking fault energy the energy level is different for the bcc material and the excess material so that's why excess material doesn't show any dbt also that is the brittle transition is not showing mainly because of this the variation in the stacking fault energy that is um, crystal structure stacking fault is different no it is the crystallography you should understand the crystallography metal the knowledge is required to understand the stacking fault energy so that is that may be the reason even if you do mild steel i don't expect the definite uh, fatigue limit okay you are for you have to apply the, the criteria whether it is uh, 1 into 10 power seven, 1 to 1 cycle or it is the uh, 10 lakh cycle you decide you decide so whenever no as far i i cannot i suppose no you need to come for the same long time so you i told i will tell them to stop up to the 10 lakh cycle Okay, and the mention that at 10 lakh cycles, this is the stress. Okay, this is the stress, the failure occurred. So you do the test, you run the test until 10 to 6 cycles, 10 lakh cycles. And what is the stress it fails to, to attain the 10 lakh cycle? So that stress you take it as the fatigue strength. And mention that at 10 to 6 cycles, the fatigue strength is at 10 to 6 cycles. Like more you listened to your stress rate. 5.1%, 5.2%, we are specific, 0.5% each and there. Like that here also, you can specify with the cycles. 10 power 6 cycles, or 10 power 5 cycles, or 5 into 10 power 6 cycles, 2 into 10 power 6 cycles, you can specify. No need to run up to infinite number of cycles. Okay? Yes, sir. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think you all answered. Uh, and I hope only one question remaining. Uh, okay. Sir, two by Ram asked one question. Uh, is hmm. SN curve the uh, best method to predict the failure of uh, geomaterials like rocks, concrete, subject to cycle loading? Is it, sir? No. No, <laughs> it's, it's not for the geomaterials because part of what I discussed is the fitting of metals. Yeah, okay, exactly. fitting of metals and fitting of alloys. You want to see, I, 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 I want to tell the uh, the weavers, <coughs> uh, whatever the material now I am taking, it's I am referring from a mechanical metallurgy by John G. Dieter. Dieter book. Okay, it's, a, it's an excellent book. Uh, it's a, if you happen to get the book, a copy of the book, uh, please read this. That's why if you read this uh, repeating of metals in the chapter, if you read that, I cover only half of the chapter now. Maybe tomorrow we'll cover the petty crack work and other things. So if you read that book now, immediately you can understand how this is what I told you. So if you read after one month, you will forget what I told today, then it will be the problem. So I am taking all the, this everything on the board point also, but based on the title book. So they have given the title itself, you see the fitting of metals. Okay, so it is whatever I discussed today, it is for the metals and alloys. To some extent, you can apply to the MMCs, metal matrix composition. And uh, uh, PMC, polymer matrix composition, but not for the geometry. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, thank, thank you so you. much. I think uh, almost answered all the questions. Yes. And uh, thank you, sir. So, so we will be tomorrow. We will discuss. We will discuss for the uh, remaining half. How the petty crack is initiating? How the petty crack is propagating? Uh, what is the traction mechanics concept? All those things we will discuss tomorrow. That is on the petty crack both again. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, dear participants, thank you so much. We will uh, meet you tomorrow. And uh, so, if you have any uh, clarification, you can uh, uh, 
reach me through my whatsapp number and as i uh, told uh, yesterday so a few of you who have not submitted the uh, proper uh, your uh, photo and uh, the payment receipts so those who are done kindly uh, uh, contact me through whatsapp and please do it and and i hope yesterday i i got lot of messages uh, so the link what i have given uh, is the uh, video you can refer uh, refer of the programs which you have been conducted earlier and also the uh, certificates i have given some only to verify the certificate there is not uh, your uh, certificates so like this your certificate will also uh, will be certificates or the list of participants will also be available in the uh, same website which can be uh, uh, made available for verification so to uh, know the uh, genuinity of the certificates okay so not your certificate that is about the uh, previous program which has been conducted okay so uh, once uh, your certificate is issued so your certificates uh, or your name also will be available in the same link so by which you can uh, the genuineness can be ensured for that only i have given the link okay. and thank you so much thank you so much for your participation the uh, the purpose of this uh, program is to purely uh, enhance the fundamentals of the faculty researchers and students community uh, as a social responsibility uh, from the channel for technology okay. so thank you for your support and thank you so much we will meet in tomorrow lectures